This past Sunday, after reading the gospel parable of the workers in the vineyard, my parish pastor reminded us that we are all privileged to be working in the vineyard. Father James Martin is someone who takes this privilege very seriously, yet with a lightness that makes us all laugh and gives us the opportunity to laugh while savoring the gifts of our faith. So tonight, we're in for a real treat, as I'm sure you know by your presence here. And Father Mark Massa of the Society of Jesus, Dean of the School of Theology and Ministry, will now say a few more words about Father Martin. Good evening. Uh, I'm Mark Bassa. I'm the Dean of the STM, and I'm delighted to see so many of you here. Jim Martin is a friend of mine. <laughs> That's the important stuff. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, yeah, he's also a Jesuit priest, author of several books that have appeared on the New York Times bestseller lists. He serves currently as the editor at large for America Magazine. Oh, and did I tell you he's a friend of mine? <laughs> Before arriving in the flesh pots of 56th Street in New York, which is where America Magazine's offices are, Jim worked with the Missionaries of Charity at a hospice run for the Missionaries of Charity for the sick and dying in Jamaica. He worked with street gang members while he was in first studies in Chicago. And for two years, he worked with the, the Jesuit Refugee Service in Kenya, where he helped East African refugees start small businesses. His books, Jesus, A Pilgrimage, and The Jesuit Guide to Almost Everything, were both New York Times bestsellers. And his 2006 memoir, which was entitled My Life with the Saint, with the Saints, received the Christopher Award for that year as well as being named one of the best books of the year by Publishers Weekly. It was also awarded first place by the Catholic Press Association. That's actually a big deal. So why don't we give him a pause? No, 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 I'm not done, I'm not done. I'm not done. <laughs> Jim has appeared uh, on National Public Radio's Fresh Air with Terry Gross, on Weekend Edition, and on All Things Considered. He, appeared on, he has appeared on PBS's NewsHour and the Colbert Report. Oh, and did I tell you he's a friend of mine? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Jim Martin. Thank you so much, and he is a friend of mine to complete the circle. I am very, very happy to be here. Thank you, Mark Massa and Melinda Donovan. Thank you to the School of Theology and Ministry. Uh, thank you for the Church in the 21st Century Institute, uh, the co-sponsors of, uh, of this talk tonight. Uh, I have to say I am a proud graduate of BC's School of Theology and Ministry. Um, now I am. <laughs> Formerly Weston Jesuit School of Theology, formerly Weston School of Theology, formerly Weston College, formerly Weston in the Woods, formerly the Woods, I suspect. Um, now, I really, uh, I owe so much to, uh, to the STM um, and to the teachers. Uh, I, I won't name them and embarrass them, but I really, uh, they, they taught me how to think, they taught me how to think about God, they taught me how to pray, and uh, I'm very grateful to them and to my brother Jesuits, and I'm just happy to be back. And I'm, I'm happy to be back uh, to talk about Jesus, uh, who was the center of our studies uh, at the STM. By the way, if there's some donor out there, please give the STM some money to, so they can have a nice name. You know, STM is so unwieldy, you know, so. <laughs> let, me, uh, let me tell you a story that spans several decades. Um, I also want to say I'm, I'm happy to be back in Boston. Boston is my spiritual home. I'm a New England province Jesuit, and so I feel like this is my spiritual home. Uh, anyway, so here's a story that spans several decades, and it shows why it sometimes takes a long time for people, uh, including me, to understand the Gospels and to begin to understand Jesus. 
The first chapter happened when I was a Jesuit novice. It's nice to be able to say this in a crowd who will understand this, in Jamaica Plain. Um, <laughs> right, yay, Jamaica Plain. Uh, <laughs> 25 years ago, uh, during the first month of the novitiate, I read, a I read a book that talked about a place called the Bay of Parables. The Bay of Parables. While I can't remember what book this was, I remember the vivid impression that this made on me. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus finds himself so hemmed in by crowds that he climbs aboard a boat and asks Peter to row out into the Sea of Galilee so he can preach uh, from the sea, from off the shore. The Gospels of Mark and Matthew, as you all know, I'm sure, also report incidents of Jesus' preaching from a boat. In Galilee, said this book that I read, there is still a place known as the Bay of Parables, where that gospel passage most likely happened. Near the shoreline is a naturally occurring amphitheater, right? Shaped like this, shaped like the, uh, the, the auditorium that we are in. And it would have, been, uh, it would have made uh, easier for people to sit comfortably and listen to Jesus preach. Moreover, the unique acoustics of the site by the Bay of Parable would have made it easier for the large crowd to hear Jesus. The idea that people could identify exactly where a particular scripture story happened really captivated me. I remember thinking, to use some theological language that I learned at the STM, that is so cool. <laughs> I learned that in church history. Um, <laughs> But the explanation really baffled me. Why did Jesus get into a boat to address a crowd? I imagine the carpenter from Nazareth getting in Peter's boat, wobbling a little bit. Why wouldn't he stand on the shoreline, right? At that naturally occurring amphitheater. Because of its oddness, the tale of the Bay of Parables really stuck with me. Second chapter of my story. A few years later, I was on a summer vacation at, I'm happy to say this, at the uh, Jesuit community of Boston College's vacation home in Cohasset, Massachusetts, yes, which you undoubtedly know. One morning, a few Jesuits and I were sitting on the lawn, maybe some of you have been there, that overlooks the, uh, the harbor, or since I'm back in Boston, the harbor. Um, <laughs> we heard a commotion in the harbor, which turned out to be a sailing school. You maybe have even seen this sailing school, like little sunfish that go out from the, the Cohasset Yacht Club into the harbor. And we could hear these kids. The, the distance between us was about a mile or two from the lawn. But we could hear the kids as if they were like 10 feet away. You could hear their voices. I can't do this. My sail won't work. I don't know how to do this. And you could hear their instructor. No, no, no. Don't touch that. Not that. No, 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 don't touch that. I remarked to a fellow Jesuit uh, how uh, unusual it was that we could hear their voices so clearly. And one Jesuit said, well, of course, Jim, sound travels very easily over water. Do you remember that story of Jesus preaching from the boat? That's one reason he did it that way. It was probably easier for the crowds to hear him. His casual insight really delighted me. It reminded me that sometimes what we may not get in the Gospels often turns out to have a real-life explanation once we think more carefully about the, spiritual, the, the historical context of the story. Finally, a third chapter. Many years after that, three years ago in 2011, I took a trip to the Holy Land as part of uh, research for this new book, Jesus, a Pilgrimage, which is on sale at a discount outside. <laughs> and makes the perfect gift for all your friends and family. <laughs> I was there for about two weeks, uh, mainly in Galilee up north and Jerusalem down south with a Jesuit friend of mine named George. Maybe you know him, his name's George Williams. He's now the Catholic chaplain at San Quentin. Um, people always laugh when I say that. And I said to someone, why are people laughing? And they said, well, it's as if you think we're all in San Quentin. Um, <laughs> He is the Catholic chaplain of San Quentin. Anyway, um, George and I arrive in Jerusalem about 10 years after my encounter in Cohasset with the noisy sailing school. At dinner on the first night, the superior of the Jesuit community, uh, which is called the Pontifical Biblical Institute, uh, the guy's name, he's a Vietnamese Jesuit named Father Duan, welcomes us and over dinner asks us what place we would most like to see. And I say, you know, waiting 25 years to see this place, the Bay of Parables. And he says, the what? <laughs> now, 
here's a Jesuit who's also a scripture scholar who has lived in Jerusalem for like 10 years. And I thought, well, all right, maybe it's the one place he hasn't heard of. <laughs> a few days later, we make the four hour drive um, up to the Sea of Galilee, and we find our way to a Franciscan guest house located right on the Mount of the Beatitudes, right on the Sea of Galilee, overlooking the Sea of Galilee. And we find the uh, sister in charge, whose name was, I always have to stop myself, her name was Sister Tele, Sister Tele, see, I was, it's terrible. Her name was Sister Tellus Flora, but George kept calling her Sister Teleflora. <laughs> <laughs> so I could never get her name right. He actually called her Sister 1-800-Teleflora. <laughs> So Sister, <laughs> Sister Telesfora, which who's this lovely and very well-educated Franciscan sister, herself a scripture scholar, asks us, fathers, so what place would you most like to see? And I say, the Bay of Parables. And she says, the what? <laughs> now, I have to underline this, she lives on the Sea of Galilee, right? <laughs> uh, after she, when I described it, about the book that I'd read in the novitiate. She shook her head and furrowed her brow as if I were insane or deluded or both. George rolled his eyes afterward and said to me, my friend is quite funny, uh, he said, it's like you were asking her about Santa's workshop in the North Pole. <laughs> <laughs> a few hours later, we make our way to a place called Tabga, the traditional site of the miracle of the multiplication of the loaves and the fishes. And we prayed in a small chapel there. It's run by the, the, the site is run by the Benedictines. Afterwards, in the inevitable gift shop, um, which was founded by Jesus, um, <laughs> you know, we, we can only imagine or assume. Anyway, I, I, that 30% off. Um, <laughs> There's a Benedictine there, and I say to George, I'm going to ask him something. And he says, if you ask him about the Bay of Parables, I'm leaving. <laughs> so I go over, and I say, uh, excuse me. And it turns out he's uh, German-speaking. I don't speak German. I speak like three words. And I said, bitte, you know, uh, wo ist die? I said, Bay of Parables. And I fully expected him to say, the what? And he says, yeah, 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 the Bay of Parables, yeah. I know the Bay of Parables. It's very close to here. So I was like, that's fantastic. So his German, uh, uh, my German was terrible, and he didn't speak very uh, much English. So George, believe it or not, not just for the purposes of this story, George speaks fluent German, right? <laughs> so I called George over, who was kind of embarrassed and like sort of looking at the cards to try to avoid talk about the Bay of Parables. And I said, could you translate? So the guy goes, blah, blah, blah. And he actually doesn't say blah, blah, blah. He says something in German. And, um, so George translates, and he said, it's very close, it's near an opening in the bushes here. Yeah, yeah, there's an opening, there's an opening in the bush. And, and the guy says something again, and, and uh, George looks at him, and he says, I think he said, follow the rocks that are painted violet? And the guy goes, yeah, yeah, the violet colored rocks, they are violet color. <laughs> so, he paints, he makes us a little map, and under the blistering hot sun, it must have been 110 degrees, really. George and I follow his map. We go through the bush uh, right near the chapel, and sure enough, almost trip over several boulders spray painted purple. And George says, Violet, they are violet colored rocks. <laughs> and guess what? Guess what? Immediately before us, the ground drops away from us, and we find ourselves on the rim of a naturally occurring amphitheater, right? People had likely stood here and listened to Jesus preach from the boat. Or as is often is said in the Holy Land, if it didn't happen here, then it happened a few hundred yards from here. <laughs> as I gazed on the blue-green water sparkling under the sun, I could easily picture him sitting on a boat. And George turned to me and said, the Bay of Parables. <laughs> But my brothers and sisters, then I saw something that amazed me and delighted me even more, even more than seeing this place that I'd wanted to see for 25 years. All around us, there's no one there, by the way, there's no one there, it was just me and George. All around us was this, rocky ground, fertile ground, 
and thorns. Does that sound familiar? Yes. In the parable of the sower, Jesus tells the story of a farmer who goes out to sow and whose seed falls on different kinds of ground. Told in all the synoptic gospels, the parable illustrates the way that Jesus' message is received, both in his day and in our own. Jesus even explains the parables and the synoptics. The rocky ground is those who hear the word but do not allow it to take root. When trial comes, the trials come, they wither away. The thorny ground is an image for those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke it off and the seed produces no yield. But the fertile ground is those who hear the word and accept it and bear great fruit. As I stood under the broiling sun, I was amazed to see rocks and thorns and fertile ground. No one had planted thorn bushes there or carted in topsoil or arranged the stones to make the locale look as if it did in Jesus' time, as if we were in a theme park called Jesus Land, right? <laughs> they were just there. And it dawned on me that when Jesus was using objects from nature to convey his message, seeds, rocks, birds, clouds, wheat, he was probably not talking in generalities, but about these things right here. Not those people are like rocks in general, but those people are like those rocks right behind you. Not people like that are like thorns, but people like that are like those thorns. Turn around and look at that thorn bush behind you. It grounded the Gospels and Jesus in a way that I could have never imagined. It reminded me once again that Jesus Christ, the fully divine Son of God, is also fully human, right? He walked in these places. Now, what does that mean, fully human? Let's think about that for a little bit. Well, it means that Jesus of Nazareth, the person who walked the landscape of first century Palestine, and yes, the Bay of Parables, wasn't God pretending to be human. He was a flesh and blood, real life, excuse the expression, honest to God person <laughs> who experienced everything that human beings do. Jesus was born and lived and died like any human being. The, the child called Yeshua, which would have been his name, entered the world as helpless as any newborn and just as dependent on his parents. He needed to be nursed, held, fed, burped and changed, although I don't want to think about what diapers were like in first century Nazareth, <laughs> probably made of wood, um, <laughs> or burlap. Uh, as a boy growing up in the tiny town of Nazareth, more about that later, he skinned his knees, he bumped his head on doorways, he pricked his fingers on thorns, he watched the sun rise and set over the Galilean countryside, he wondered how far away the moon was and he asked his parents why the stars twinkled. Jesus had a body like yours and mine, right? Which means he ate, he drank, he slept. He experienced sexual longings and urges. He was human. He felt joy and sadness. We know that he wept, right? We know that from the story of Lazarus. He laughed too, because he was a human being. He felt frustration and enthusiasm. He grew tired at the end of a long day. We know he falls asleep in the boat, right? He gets sick. Two years ago, uh, believe it or not, um, I was, uh, this is not the believe it or not part, uh, our um, Jesuit community was uh, afflicted by a norovirus, you know, and if there are any religious here, you know that if one person in your religious community gets sick, everyone gets sick, right? So one night when I was um, hunched over the toilet uh, for the fifth time, I had a thought, and the thought was, um, Jesus did this. I'm going to just be blunt. Jesus threw up. People, go, sometimes I say that in churches, they go, oh, you know. <laughs> he threw up. He threw up. He went to the bathroom. I mean, he was human. He was a human being. He's like us in all things except sin. Jesus' humanity is a stumbling block for many people, including a few Christians, maybe even people here. Gospel stories that show him displaying intense emotions can unsettle those who prefer to focus on his divinity only. At one point in the Gospel of Mark, he speaks sharply to a woman who asks him to heal her daughter. The woman is not Jewish, and as a result, Jesus seems to dismiss her with a sharp comment, quote, Jesus is quote, it is not fair to take children's food and throw it to the dogs. That is a stinging rebuke, right? No matter what the context, excuse me. Jesus' nose ran too. <laughs> 
The woman responds that even the dogs get the crumbs from the table, and Jesus softens and heals her daughter. Why does he speak so sharply? You ever wonder about that? Was it because he was visiting what Mark calls the region of Tyre, a non-Jewish area, where he was presumably not expected to perform any miracles? Maybe. But if so, why didn't he respond to the woman more gently? Scripture scholars, the, um, the great Sacropagina series edited by Father Dan Harrington, one of my heroes, may he rest in peace, I'm sure many of you knew him, says that this is a, quote, highly insulting, you know, uh, that, 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 that comment, dogs, is either referring to her, her and her daughter, or her people. Highly insulting in any context. Was he testing her faith, maybe? Challenging her to believe? If so, it's also a harsh way of doing that, at odds with the compassionate Jesus that we expect to meet everywhere in the Gospels. Perhaps, however, Jesus needed to learn something from the woman's persistence, that is, his ministry extended to everyone, not just Jews. Or maybe he was just tired. A few lines earlier in the Gospel, Mark tells us, quote, he entered a house and did not want, to know, did not want anyone to know he was there, right? Maybe that curt remark indicates physical weariness. Whatever the case, and we'll never know for sure until we get to ask Jesus in heaven, and believe you me, I have a lot of questions for him. <laughs> Both possibilities, he is learning and he is tired, show Jesus' humanity on full display. But there's another part of the story, a healing. Jesus says to the woman, for saying that you may go, the demon has left your daughter. She returns home, says Mark, and finds her daughter healed. Fully human and fully divine means that Jesus of Nazareth wasn't just a great guy, an inspiring teacher and a holy person. He was God. In response to Jesus' question, who do you say that I am, on the way to Caesarea Philippi, Peter finally answers correctly, you are the Messiah. And here's something I learned from Dan Harrington just as I was writing this book. But the Messiah at the time did not encompass the idea of divinity, right? When they talked about the Messiah, the person who would kind of restore Israel's fortunes, right, and bring about this change, it didn't encompass the idea of divinity. Jesus is divine, much more than Peter's response and confession can encompass. Jesus performs astonishing deeds, what the gospel writers call works of power, or in the gospel of John, signs. Today we call them miracles. Healing the sick, calming storms, raising people from the dead, Time and time again, the Gospels report that Jesus' followers, no matter how long they've been with him, are, quote, amazed or astonished. One of my favorite lines after Jesus heals a paralyzed man in the Gospel of Mark is, we have never seen anything like this. I want to say, no kidding. You know? <laughs> Even his detractors took note of his miracles. The question in the Gospels is not whether Jesus does miracles, it's where his power comes from, right, and why he's doing them on the Sabbath. The miracles are an essential part of the story of Jesus, as are other signs of his divinity. So is the resurrection. If Jesus' humanity is a stumbling block for people, his divinity is even more so. For a rational modern mind, talk of the supernatural is disturbing, an embarrassment even. I'm sure you know people who, who maybe even people in this audience who admire Jesus and say he's so compassionate and I, I follow the Beatitudes, but all that stuff about mm, like raising people from the dead and healing people and walking on water and the resurrection, I don't know about that. They stop short of believing him to be fully divine. Despite the proportion of the Gospels that focus on his works of power, in fact, some of the, most, uh, some of the sayings that we take for granted, you know, and say, obviously, Jesus said that, are in the context of healing stories. Despite all that, many want to confine his identity to that, to that of just a wise teacher. Thomas Jefferson went so far as to create his own gospel by focusing on Jesus' ethical teachings and literally scissoring out the stuff he didn't like, right? Jefferson, like many of us, preferred his own version of Jesus, not the one in the gospels. Like many of us, he felt uncomfortable with some parts of the gospels. He wanted a Jesus who didn't threaten or discomfort him. He wanted a Jesus he could tame, basically. But you can't tame Jesus. In fact, the scripture scholar E.P. Sanders uh, wrote a book called The Historical Figure of Jesus, and he did a study. He figured, well, I'm going to read Thomas Jefferson's gospel and see who, the, who Jesus is for Thomas Jefferson. And he realized it was like this, this wise, knowledgeable person, and he said Jesus was basically Thomas Jefferson, you know? <laughs> Yeah, 
You know, I asked uh, Dan Harrington, to whom this book is dedicated once, uh, he said that people who focus solely on the historical uh, figure of Jesus, which is very important, I'll talk about that in a little bit, solely on the historical figure, often find themselves, you know, uh, they, they look into the, the, the mirror and they see themselves, basically. So Jesus is the social activist, Jesus is the prophet, those kinds of things. And at the time, the Jesus Seminar was very popular, all right, this is back in the 90s. And I said to Dan, well, what is the Jesus of the Jesus Seminar? And Dan said, Jesus, the professor of religious studies. <laughs> That's a quote. Both humanity and divinity are part of Jesus' story. Omit one or, one or another, scissor out the uncomfortable parts, and it's not Jesus we're talking about. It's our own creation. Much of this division between those who want just a human Jesus and those who want just a divine Jesus can be seen in two basic types of approaches today. People who prefer the Jesus of history and people who prefer the Christ of faith. As many of you know, I'm sure, in historical Jesus studies, scholars of the Jesus of history try to explain as much as we can know about the life and times of Jesus of Nazareth. So, books and articles will focus on stuff like the, the Jewish customs in first century Palestine, socioeconomic realities of life under Roman rule, and the ways a carpenter would have sustained his family in a small village. Such research helps us better understand Jesus within the context of his times, right? A real person. Here's an example. You all know the story of the uh, steward who's given care of his master's talents. Remember that story, the parable of the talents? So one guy gets five, one guy gets three, one guy gets one. And we hear that at mass and we say, uh, well, that's nice, you know, it's probably like a little coin or something. Well, if you know that a talent was a huge sum of money at the time, equivalent to, get this, equivalent to 15 years of wages. Exactly, for a day laborer. And you say, wow, five talents. You get a sense of what Jesus is trying to do with that story more, you know? So that's the idea behind historical Jesus studies. They use every tool available, right? Understanding of first century cultures, languages, even archeological finds in the region to help us understand his life and times. Such studies are closely aligned with what is called a Christology from below, right? Trying to understand Jesus beginning with his humanity. But there's just as many scholars and theologians who focus less on the details of his time on earth and more on his place in the Christian faith. So people who focus on the Christ of faith will focus on topics like how Christ saves us, the nature of his relationship to the Father and the Holy Spirit, right? This is a Christology from above. Starting, on Jesus, starting with Jesus as the Son of God. The difference between these two approaches can be shown with a brief example, the great story of the raising of Lazarus, okay? So, in the Gospel of John, as you probably know, the brother of Jesus' friends, Mary and Martha, in Bethany. Now, let's just stop there. It says, Jesus loved Mary and Martha. Very beautiful, right? So already there's a little insight, right, to his friendship with women in this case, right? Jesus finds out that Lazarus is ill. How does he find out? Um, how do they tell him? Like he gets a note or a message. Do they say, Lazarus, our brother, is ill? No. Do they say, Lazarus of Bethany is ill? No. Do they say, Lazarus, your friend, is ill? No. In the Greek, which is very beautiful, it's hon phileis, he whom you love. Isn't that pretty? He whom you love is ill. You know, it shows Jesus' intimate relationships with people. He waits for a couple of days, very mysterious to the disciples, right? Then he goes to Bethany, asks, where have you lain him? And the sisters first come out and say, now, if you're in Mass sometimes, you sometimes hear this reading read like this. And Mary said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. <laughs> Maybe. How about... Mary, who was a disciple of Jesus and a very close friend, we know that Jesus spent time there, and who knew of his healings and may have known of his other raising of the dead, for example, the widow of Nain. How about, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Right? These are very strong women that come out, right? And, 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 and meet him that way. He says, where have you laid him? And they say, very beautifully, come and see which is what Jesus said to the disciples at the beginning, right? He goes to the tomb, he weeps, right? A great sign of his humanity and his divinity, too. It's not just the human person weeping. And he calls out, he asks for the stone to be rolled away. 
historical Jesus uh, scholars tell us those were the kinds of stones that they would have kind of fit into a groove. That makes sense. They have evidence of those kinds of things, so you know, we can understand that story better. And he calls out in a British accent, because you've seen all the movies, <laughs> Lazarus, come forth. <laughs> because he studied at Cambridge, right? <laughs> if he studied at BC, it would have been Lazarus, come forth. <laughs> <laughs> and the dead man comes out of his tomb. The historical Jesus scholar might ask questions like this. What were Jewish burial practices at the time? Is there a significance to that waiting? Why would he have waited? What was the role of women in Jewish burial rites, right? Answers to those questions help us to understand the story more fully, and they shed light on what Jesus said and did in Bethany on that day. Someone starting from the vantage point of the Christ of faith and doing a theology from above might pose slightly different questions, would pose slightly different questions. What does the raising of Lazarus tell us about Jesus' divine power? How does the idea of life show itself in the story of Lazarus? In what way does the raising of Lazarus foretell Jesus' own resurrection, right? And what does the story of Lazarus say about, this you would find in a spiritual uh, book, what does the story of Lazarus say about our own response to God's voice calling us out of our tombs, right? Here's the point. Both sets of questions are important. Both sets of questions are important. And if we lose sight of either perspective, the Jesus of history or the Christ of faith, we risk turning Jesus either into God pretending to be human or a human being pretending to be God. The two approaches are complementary, not contradictory. So books that look at just one approach or another are, to my mind, incomplete. And you see this all the time. You'll read historical Jesus books, which are essential and really important and, and helpful for us uh, as believers. But when they come to the miracles of the resurrection, they say, well, you know, we really can't treat that here. That's not part of our studies, right? Which it isn't, but it's, it's incomplete. You read some spiritual books, and this is just as common. You read books on the spirit, you know, you read books on the Christian faith, and they talk about how Christ saves us and all that. But they say when they talk about his life in Nazareth and the hidden life, well, we're not going to look at, they say, mere historical considerations. You know, that's kind of beside the point. But that's baloney, to use a theological term. Um, <laughs> to fully meet Jesus Christ, the believer needs to understand both the Jesus of history, the man who walked the earth, and to encounter the Christ of faith, the one who rose from the dead. Right? And I'm going to go out on a limb here at STM, and I'm going to say, the Jesus of history is the Christ of faith, okay? They're the same person. Stanley Marrow, who some of you may know, uh, has a, I took a course in John with him, and he said, and I think I can quote it more or less because uh, it's in one of his books, he said, for the risen Christ to have been anything other than the Jesus of Nazareth who they know would have voided the resurrection of all meaning. It's the same person, right? So to understand and encounter Jesus Christ, we need to understand the Jesus of history and pray and meet the Christ of faith in our prayer. Both pro approaches are essential. Moreover, Jesus is always fully human and fully divine. Right? That is, he's not divine. and It's not like, okay, I'm going to raise Lazarus from the dead. I have to put my divine hat on. <laughs> and now I'm going to go back to being human. Well, that was, whew, you know, back to being human. He's fully divine and fully human at all times, which is a mystery. That is, I mean, that is a big mystery, right? And it's not one that I can, uh, you know, sort of explain to you here on this stage. Um, but I like to challenge people by saying this. Jesus is fully divine when he is in the workshop in Nazareth sawing a piece of wood. Fully divine. And he is fully human when he is stilling a storm, right? He's always fully human and fully divine. Now, there's a lot of questions we can't know. Right? We can't know. One time when I, I'm happy to be able to, it's, it's, I didn't plan on this, but I'm happy to be able to talk about Dan so much. Uh, one time in Intro to New Testament, NT 101, uh, Dan Harrington was teaching, and a student got up uh, from another school around here. I won't say which school, but it's uh, located in Harvard Square. And um, <laughs> some things we can't know. And he said, uh, he said, the student said, Father Har I'll never forget this, Father Harrington, it's a big class full of, you know, Jesuits and lay people from SDM and Harvard and, you know, uh, the consortium and all that. Father Harrington, 
At this point in the Gospels, um, with what we understand about Jesus' identity as the second person of the Trinity and his relationship vis-a-vis -vis the Father, Abba, uh, what can we know about what is going through his mind right now as he is performing these miracles and preaching the Gospel? What is going through his mind right now at this particular point in the Gospel? And Dan said, we have no idea. <laughs> But there are some things we can know, and I want to take just a little digression for a few minutes um, before we open it up for questions to talk about something I love talking about, uh, which is Nazareth. I want to talk about Nazareth. Now, how many, how many, there, how many people are in this room, would you say, Father? 500, something like that? 582 people, and there's a, it's very impressive. Um, what's that? That, that 582. So, Nazareth, look around. Just look around at this kind of the size of this room and how many people are here. Nazareth was half this size. Yeah, I know. Surprise, huh? Nazareth was between 200 and 400 people, right? How do we know that? From archaeological studies, right? I'm going to take this a little bit if you don't mind. Because um, this is just, I, I love talking about this and I don't need that. Um, <laughs> Nazareth was 200 to 400 people. Okay, we know that from archaeological studies. Nazareth was a very poor town. All right? There are many, many towns mentioned in the Talmud and the Old Testament in Galilee. Many. Something like 53. Nazareth is not. Is that interesting? Nazareth is nowhere mentioned. It's so small, it's kind of a joke. In fact, you know in the Gospel of John when uh, the apostle Nathaniel finds out, you know, we have found the Messiah, he is Jesus of Nazareth. They say, can anything good come from Nazareth? When we hear that in Mass, we say, you know, praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> but it's a dig. It's a dig. He's making fun of Nazareth. Some scripture scholars say that that may have been a saying at the time, nothing good can come from Nazareth. He's making fun. It's like saying, can anything good come from Brighton, right? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you respond. Why do you respond to that? Because you haven't heard that before. But we've lost the sense, we've lost the sense of, of, of that particular passage, among other passages. He's making a dig at Nazareth. It was populated mainly by people who lived off the land, peasants. Okay? They lived in sort of rude houses, which were basically stone houses with no roofs. How do we know that? This is why historical Jesus scholarship is so great. They don't find any arches, right? So therefore, it was probably thatched roofs. Very similar to the houses in Capernaum, which was Jesus' base of ministry in Galilee. When you think of the thatched roofs, you think of why it would make sense for someone to be able to, they removed the roof and lowered the man, right? Very interesting. Now later on, just as a digression, later on Luke says that where they took off the tiles. He's trying to make it a little more understandable for a kind of more citified audience. But originally, Mark, it's the roof, okay? So Nazareth, there's Jesus in his town of 200 to 400 people, right? Very poor. What is he doing? Well, for from the years 12 to 30, most of us think of, a lot of people think of Jesus as just kind of hanging out, you know, just like kind of looking at a piece of wood and saying, oh, maybe I'll nail something today, you know? <laughs> but he worked. He worked hard, right? He worked hard. And interestingly, New Testament scholars tell us that the crafts that he did, now he's called a tecton, which you probably know in Greek, which is translated as carpenter. It could just as easily be translated as woodworker, craftsman, even day laborer, right? He worked hard, right? And interestingly, tecton, because they didn't have a stable plot of land, ranked below the artisan class, okay? So now when we think of a carpenter, we think of someone who's Who's, who's an artisan, you know, who's a real craftsman. Not at that time. They would have seen that as a low-class occupation, right? So if you understand that, you understand that when he stands up in the temple and they say, isn't this just the carpenter? They're making, it's a, they're making fun of him. They're not saying simply, isn't this just Jesus? It's, isn't this just this guy who does this sort of low-class occupation? One New Testament scholar said that you might even be able to see sort of signs of how the, the Gospels distance themselves from that. In Mark, the earliest Gospel, it's, is this not the carpenter? Luke and Matthew, written a little later on, maybe 15, 20 years later, write, is this not the son of the carpenter? Isn't that interesting? 
a little distance from that kind of occupation. John dispenses with the occupation altogether. Is this not the son of Joseph? Isn't that interesting? So you get a sense of what Jesus is doing. This is why historical Jesus scholarship is so important. What did a carpenter do? How did they live? What, were their, what was their diet like? You know, Nazareth, 200 to 400 people, very small, agrarian, mostly peasants. An hour and a half away is, another, is a big city called Sepphoris, S-E-P-P-H-O-R-I-S, right? That had about 10,000 people in it. King Herod was building it up. It had a huge amphitheater that could seat 4,000 people. It had houses with frescoes and mosaics. How do we know that? They find it through archaeology. Do you think that a poor carpenter from a town of 200 to 400 people, desperate to earn his daily bread, wouldn't walk an hour and a half to the town of, to a town that's being rebuilt that needs carpenters? It's very likely that Jesus went to Sepphoris, probably several times. What did he see there? Well, guess what? It's a lot of Greek-speaking people there. He may have picked up a little Greek. Who knows, right? What he definitely saw was very nice houses with frescoes and mosaics. Imagine what it's like to work on something like that. This is speculative, but I don't think this is beyond the realm of possibility. Imagine someone working in a place like that and then coming back to his poor town. Wouldn't that awaken something in him? Wouldn't that awaken in him this question of why there are disparities? Why are there poor and why are there rich? You know, we tend to think when Jesus speaks about the poor and the need to care for the poor, it's all divine inspiration from him as the Son of God. And that is certainly true, right? His relationship with Abba. But he's human too. Could not part of that have come from his own experience? seeing these things as a, as a boy and as a young man, someone who's in Sepphoris and comes back and says, why does my mother have to live like that? It's very important to recover this idea of Jesus as fully human with a fully human life. He worked, he lived, right? In addition to thinking of him as the son of God. So there are a lot of things that we cannot know about Jesus, right? What went on in his mind. You know, how he understood himself as the son of God. His self-consciousness is a very big theological topic. So these questions, like so much about Jesus, must remain a mystery. But while Jesus' identity as the fully human, fully divine son of God remains a mystery, it is a beautiful mystery, the most beautiful one I know, and one well worth pondering. Thank you very much.